I'm uh, uh, Julio. Hello, everyone. And I'm here today with uh, uh, Alison uh, uh, Gardner and uh, uh, Dan Massey, who are the two founders of the Venus Plus X uh, uh, Foundation for uh, Sexual Freedom. Uh, I'd like to start this interview by asking them, and uh, I want to thank them very much for being here with us today. I'd like to start by asking them uh, uh, what is uh, their uh, Sexual Freedom Foundation and what are the objectives that uh, they want to achieve. Well, Julio, we uh, created this activity. Uh, it's not really formally organized as a foundation, but it's our personal private activity to bring about a greater public awareness of the effect that sexual repression has had on the development and progress of human society and to take deliberate actions to change that. Um, that's a rather shorthand view of it, but uh, it's, it's based on the premise that uh, we believe sexual repression is at the foundation of most uh, bad behavior, grief, neurosis, and other problems that beset us in society today and have been problems for a long time. And it's ne necessary to make a serious attempt to correct that. And so that's really, uh, in the broadest sense, what our campaign I is about. It's much broader than that in a sense it's because it's broader than that in a sense because it's I'm sorry, did you want to go on I'm to sorry, another question? Do you want to go on to another question? Uh, no, uh, I got the timing wrong. Just uh, continue what I was saying and then we'll go on with that question. Do you want me to continue? Is that what you were saying? Yes. 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 <clears throat> I was saying that um, sexual freedom is the uh, important goal that we would like to achieve because we think it will allow the reformation of human society and will allow people to agree on objectives and move forward to accomplish many great goals that are completely unreachable now because of the negative influences uh, that pervade our society, which are grounded in the mythic structure of religion, government, commerce, and our cult very cultures themselves. So this is a fairly tall order to consider taking on these kinds of things. But that's basically what we are about. And the website is simply one place where we record and promulgate our thoughts on this subject. Thank you very much. I think I understand, uh, but I think I would understand even uh, better if you could me if you could give me one uh, specific example of how sexual uh, repression is uh, hurting people at this moment and also hindering our uh, progress as a species. Well, worldwide uh, homophobia, in fact, phobia of all forms of sexual expression throughout all human cultures, religions, uh, governments, and so forth, the basic rejection of sex, which begins almost from the moment a child is born uh, and deeply programs their mind to basically uh, live in opposition to their most fundamental desires and needs which they will grow into, creates an internal conflict which leads to uh, arguments between people, inability to find common goals, inability to move ahead on common purposes, and generally the attitude that everyone is your enemy and that your goal is to protect yourself against them and secondarily to exploit them to the fullest ability that you can achieve in order to forward yourself and gain advantage over the other person. Uh, our society tends to work this way. Most people are indoctrinated into this way of functioning. And as you can see from all around us, it is a failure. It continues to be a failure. 
and the way it has to be changed is to get at the very fundamental misunderstandings the very visceral things that are programmed into people very deeply and making them change now you ask well how does this affect things well for one thing it affects the ability of LGBT people in general that is lesbian bisexual gay and transgender people to participate meaningfully in society even though they are among the most creative and gifted people that are produced by human reproduction but the de deliberate attempt to exclude these people from participation in society which goes on worldwide and is supported by governments political parties churches commerce companies villages even uh, is what has to change and uh, the way it has to change is that people have to be provided with superior view of reality that shows that what they have done by tradition coming out of the past centuries is wrong at its most fundamental levels and needs considerable rethinking and our purpose is to force these issues out into public discussion and cause them to be explored and people to become more broadly educated in this subject in terms of specifics I, I hardly know where to start you look around you and you see a society that basically is failing and uh, the failure is because the society will not uh, <clears throat> pay attention to what's really important and is hung up on irrelevancies, stupidities and other things and until you get the individual attitude towards erotic pleasure sorted out not just with individuals but with entire communities you're going to continue to have this going on um, and I think this is one of the main reasons why transhumanism hasn't made any progress so far in the last several decades uh, it's thought of a lot of ideas but it has not much acceptance for the simple reason that people cannot agree on how to split up the spoils of the undertaking thank you very much well we come back to the subject of uh, transhumanism toward the, uh, the end of this chat uh, uh, right if I can remind you to switch your own microphone off when I'm speaking right. like right. that we don't have it Okay, um, let's uh, go back to the issue of uh, sexual freedom for the time being. And I have uh, here in this uh, um, uh, virtual room some uh, screenshots from, from your uh, website. And uh, there is one which I find uh, quite interesting which says that uh, gender doesn't exist. Uh, uh, by the way, um, we are not going to show the Venus uh, plus X dot org website in uh, 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 detail here, but of course it is uh, available on the web. Mm. Gender doesn't exist. Uh, what does that mean? it means that there is nothing about people really uh, genetically that determines how they should fit into society that gender as it's generally interpreted in contemporary society is a social construct not a natural product of how people are what we uh, feel we what evidence shows is that sexual orientation is primarily determined uh, by genetic characteristics uh, with some element of choice and preference overlaid on it uh, it is heavily uh, uh, inhibited and directed by social pressure but once you get past sexual orientation which deals with the issue of who you would have sex with uh, you get to the issue of gender which is how you think you should fit in to society as a whole and therefore your choices currently are limited by the spaces that society makes for self-expression 
which in most communities are strictly limited to either male or female. Um, in reality, though, there is no particular reason that the presentation of gender uh, needs to be coupled to one's biological sexual identity. And in fact, quite a bit of ongoing work uh, has shown that uh, these uh, distinctions uh, come about through social pressure and that people, many people who experience these phenomena actually have variations in brain development or in physical development that cause things like the actual genetic sex, the sexual orientation, and the mental sex or the gender, if you will, to the to all be conflated and not our society does not accept that these things can be independent choices uh, of, that are a product of individual genetics and individual social position, and we try to force things into a very small number of roles. So the point really is that <clears throat> gender is an artificial concept and the number of people in society who uh, are oppressed by this is quite small, around maybe one or two percent of society feel oppressed by it, primarily because the rest of the people who are being oppressed by it are so oppressed they're not even allowed to think about the fact that they're being oppressed which goes back to the fundamental problem that sexual oppression is the source of most of our social problems in society. Oh yeah, well Allison reminds me that racial oppression, uh, racial prejudice really is driven primarily by sexual competition between uh, <clears throat> the variant races, fear of sex, uh, both uh, coming from or going to someone who is in some way visibly different than yourself. And this gets back again to paranoia. And we think sexual paranoia is really the major driving force between uh, racism as well. We think that once you get past the sexual aspect, the issues of racism will be much less significant. Maybe I should let you take the mic some. Well, this is a very interesting point of view. Uh, I have a curiosity. Uh, your website is called uh, Venus Plus Eight, and I believe that was uh, actually the name of a science fiction novel. Can you say something about that? and how it relates to the actual uh, uh, objectives of your website. Sure. <clears throat> there, uh, Theodore Sturgeon wrote a, very early in his career, wrote a science fiction novel with the title Venus Plus X, spaced out as three different words. And the theme of this was a man from the 1950s. This novel was published in 1960 a man from the 1950s who is transported to a future world in which humanity lives in symbiosis with complex uh, medical machinery and in which people are revised genetically and physically throughout their entire life development so that the matured adult of the species is a complete androgyne able to be impregnated and be pregnant and give birth to offspring. And in this society, there are no men or women. Everyone has identical uh, <clears throat> genetic uh, and sexual apparatus, and everyone functions the same way, except, of course, in the, his society, there are pair bonds formed between couples, which then produce children and so forth. One of the themes of it is that this future society, which he calls a lead which is model spelled backwards, um, <clears throat> the center of their uh, religious worship is children. Uh, this represents, uh, Sturgeon represents a really uh, interesting view of what a society like this might be like and how it would be viewed by a 
uh, man of the 1950s, uh, basically an American, uh, of course. And um, it is clear that, uh, you know, he's basically saying that the sexual dichotomy in the species is the source of a lot of human problems. And in his ideal society, they've all gone away. Now, we don't happen to think that Sturgeon's prescription is necessarily the right answer. It's just a particular science fiction vision of how such a state might come to be. Nor do we necessarily think the erasure of all sexual differentiation is a reasonable objective either. We have no idea on these subjects. But we note that his novel is one of the earliest and widely distributed expressions of the concept of androgyny as an <clears throat> foundational element in society. And by androgyny, I mean specifically the reduction in the dichotomy between the male and the female in sexual performance and also in gender presentation. And Sturgeon's pioneering thought on this subject was why we chose to use the name more or less as a bit of homage to his work. Uh, there is an excerpt from his book where his philosophy is laid out in great detail. It's about 10 pages long. We republished it on our website for interested people. But this is basically not our agenda so much as it is a broad agenda for how society could be made better by reducing this polarization. So that's why we've used Venus plus X really as our name. It's very interesting, very interesting. and uh, yeah. as a matter of fact, uh, I also think that uh, very frequently uh, science fiction literature has uh, the best uh, acts and uh, sometimes the best uh, ideas for how our uh, society should uh, uh, develop. I'm a big science fiction fan. I remember I read the Sturgeon's book uh, a very long time ago, maybe 30 years ago, but I don't want to read it again. And uh, I'm sure you will uh, agree with me of the important role of uh, science fiction uh, uh, literature, because I know that you are uh, also a science fiction fan. And I know that uh, you are a scientist as well, with a scientific uh, background that goes uh, very deep beyond in the 20th century to the 70s or the 80s. Perhaps. Could you say something about your uh, uh, background as a scientist? And uh, uh, after you say that, could you say something about how your background as a scientist uh, relates to your uh, political activism today to support gender freedom? Okay, uh, let me see if I can cover all that. Um, basically, um, when I was a kid, I, wanted, I thought I wanted to be a scientist or an engineer of some sort, and I got a physics degree from MIT and an applied math degree from Harvard. But as I uh, went through all this education, I gradually realized that uh, uh, I really wasn't interested in being a scientist in the sense of someone who did lab work collecting data, and that I didn't really feel there was enough academic freedom in the area of theoretical physics to accomplish anything meaningful outside the envelope of this huge uh, uh, formal research structure that was emerging at that time. And I became attracted to more epistemological questions, which were dealt with, in my experience, by the metamathematicians of the early 20th century, such as Gödel and Turing and Church and Post, and I could go on and on. Uh, so I spent a lot of my time investigating uh, metamathematics. And it's really from that that I came to realize that physicists don't have a very good grasp on reality. 
uh, nor do chemists or any of that other crowd that call themselves hard scientists. Uh, don't mean to pick on you, Julio. I have a physics degree, and so do you. But, but what I mean by this is that the questions I had about the world and that were important to me could not be answered by more precise measurements of velocity, temperature, mass, uh, particle interactions, or any of these other wonderful things that are so clearly worked out uh, in uh, the part of physics that's really clearly nailed down. I don't mean to pick on physics, but I saw that this was a heavily explored area and that there were vast areas of human thought that had not been approached with anything like the degree of open-mindedness or rigor that characterized the physics community or other hard science community. In most other areas having to do with mind science or spiritual science, there's really nothing there except prejudice and mythic legacies primarily from religion, but also from very bad science done outside the envelope of factual science. Um, I felt that we could explore beyond this, that there are technologies of the mind and technologies of the spirit that can be applied quite constructively to our interaction with the world and that we have no need to be limited to the belief that everything in the world is F equals MA. I briefly, well, not so briefly, once thought that if we could get the initial state of all the particles in the universe, then with Newtonian mechanics, we could compute the future. Um, as I got further into computing, I realized that wasn't going to happen. But uh, the reality is that I, you know, and as you get further into physics, you realize physics doesn't work that way either. But inasmuch as we don't quite know what we could replace it with that will work better, um, and that's been a slow up, uphill battle for the last hundred years, um, we're, we're sort of stuck with a, an engineering view of the world that works uh, mechanically, but no comparable view of the mental state or the spiritual state of individual people that takes as much of anywhere at all. So my feeling is that in order to change the world you have to basically give people a new spiritual vision that will then shift their intellectual attitude and that in turn will you know you're not going to change the facts of science I mean the facts that have actually been discovered and tested because those are facts but you may gain new perception a new perspective on them because you discover that you have been looking at them in a limited environment and haven't taken into account all the phenomena that could occur and influence these things. So we don't really have, you know, we have psychology and psychiatry which purport to be sciences of the mind and particularly cognitive psychology and they're pretty good in some ways. I mean they have a lot of good ideas also they have a lot of bullshit that got into them over the years and they don't have a good academic attitude at this stage towards getting to important fundamentals or getting rid of the bullshit but that's just my view of cognitive psychology by someone who's only casually been in it when we move into religion though we have a major problem in that there's just basically nothing on offer to people that does anything for them or helps them in spite of the number of people crowding churches and thinking they're being helped. In the final analysis, you know, as Milton said, the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. And then I'm suddenly saying, maybe that wasn't Milton. Oh, well, <laughs> I'll have to think about that one further. But that's always been the characteristic of people who want to set up religious organizations and religious systems that constrain people's beliefs and force them to fit into particular patterns that are either socially accepted or believed by a bunch of bullies on top of the system. And human beings being what they are, it's mostly the bullies who are running everything these days. And when the headset falls off, that does interrupt the conversation. So that's a bunch of notions. I'm not sure I answered both of your questions, though. Um, Uh, Let me pause for a minute. Yeah, we're going to come back to some of these points uh, uh, later. I keep seeing uh, Alison in the background. Uh, I should say that uh, this was not uh, the plan. The plan was to have both uh, 
Alison and Dan on two different screens, uh, but uh, you know, one of uh, their computers wasn't working very well, and uh, technology is still what it is. Uh, I had to improve it, make it better. But I'd like to ask Alison to step forward and yes. let uh, himself yes. be seen. Not half the face we have, but all face. With uh, the headphones. Good to see you, Alison. And uh, could you also say something on your background and how you decided to become uh, an activist in the area of uh, sexual freedom? Uh, well, my background, uh, I began as a, a teacher, and I guess I've always uh, remained a teacher. I feel that education or a lack of education presents a, a real roadblock to change just about in every level. Um, but I spent most of my career in uh, business development and marketing. And um, I quickly realized that those same tools that I use to create uh, media campaigns and marketing brochures could be brought to bear on uh, things that really mattered uh, in terms of changing hearts and minds, not to get them to buy, buy a product or service, but to open up their thinking in ways that perhaps they hadn't uh, thought about. So it's my background, and that's how I sort of approach uh, what we're doing. But uh, I have a long history. I was very radicalized by um, my knowledge and uh, tangential experience of the American Civil Rights Movement. Um, I was an anti-war activist during the Vietnam War and, um, you know, really believe that, you know, the world is in the state it's in, uh, now under the control of a conspiracy of the greedy and the stupid. And, um, mostly the stupid being exploited by the greedy. And, um, you know, that should be a very easy straw dog to knock down because there's no real content, as Dan was saying, that offers people anything that will improve their life other than uh, mystical beliefs, which, you know, may carry you for a while uh, but it doesn't get at the root problem of making a direct connection with your own uh, higher mind and letting that determine uh, what you do. This is a, a very interesting way of putting it. Uh, in fact, I remember that uh, last time I have seen you guys uh, face to face. Well, uh, I'm seeing you face to face now. Last time I have seen you guys uh, in uh, physical space. Uh, see you in uh, a mix space. That was a couple of months ago in uh, New York. Uh, and we were in the middle of the first phase of the Occupy Wall Street movement. And I remember that uh, I was with uh, uh, I was with uh, uh, Dan somewhere in the town, and you were supposed to join us, but you were not able to join us because you were uh, stuck in uh, uh, Times Square, which uh, on that day it was occupied by thousands and uh, thousands of uh, participants in Occupy Wall Street. Now, I do understand that you support the Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, as I do. And uh, what I'd like to ask you is, do you think uh, Occupy Wall Street may represent uh, a first uh, a wave of uh, uh, change 
and uh, do you think that its uh, evolution may have uh, important effects on our society in the sense that we would like to see? Uh, yes, we are very supportive of the movement because we believe it supports our goal, which is to usher in a new age of sexual freedom that's free from racial and sexual oppression, uh, where children are born into the world uh, safe from any interference from government, uh, religions, corporations, that they get to decide for themselves the kind of person they want to be. So uh, we set that as our mission statement sometime before the Occupy movement came about, but we very much felt it's in keeping. And of course, back in the 60s, when we were protesting the end of the Vietnam War, um, we thought it was going to happen next week because we were out there protesting. But really, we had to give birth to the generation that would be free from ageism and sexism and racism that could see its way clear to join together in this fashion. And, um, you know, we think it's not going to go away, that yes, this is the beginning. Uh, the conversation has already changed. The pa page has turned over. Um, in DC, we actually have two occupations. We have the Occupy Wall Street affiliated group and a corresponding group called Stop the Machine. And they had much longer lead time in planning what they do. They occupy a huge space right in the middle of DC, much bigger than the Occupy DC. And, um, you know, they have been given a permit. As a matter of fact, their four month camping permit in this public park um, was just extended another month by the Park Service. And you know that the Park Service would not be doing that without a nod from the White House that it was OK. And this level of accommodation of it shows that you know, Obama and his administration and many people in government are very supportive of the occupiers. They want to see something dislodge this crazy conspiracy of the greedy and the stupid. And now you could say that comprises maybe 25% of the population. But because they use fear and racial oppression and sexual oppression, they have everybody frightened right now. So people coming out in the street uh, is a very important turning point. And I must say, when I was in Times Square for that you know, demonstration uh, where a police came on horseback to physically push back a crowd and then arrested them, you know, those that didn't, weren't chased away. But we were so packed in there, we, everybody was spooning. Thousands and thousands of people were laying in each other's bodies. And it was so incredibly peaceful and so incredibly powerful that I'll never forget it. Um, uh, reading the press, I have the impression that uh, at this moment, the Occupy movement is uh, uh, very much seen in its uh, economic aspects. Meaning that uh, we complain about the banks, we complain about unemployment. Uh, there are many people who have been forced out of their homes. Uh, it's uh, not always easy to see so, uh, the other aspects that you are uh, uh, referring to in Occupy. Those aspects that have uh, more to do with uh, civil uh, uh, freedom rights. But do you believe, uh, besides the economic issues, this uh, new civil rights movement, like in the is an important 
uh, part of the Occupy movement today. <clears throat> I don't think the Occupy movement is about civil rights or asking for rights. It's demanding, you know, the archaic and dead system to make way for something new. Um, you know, I was, you know, a teenager and born into the feminist movement. And the feminist movement, which in my day included many, many men who claimed they were feminist, uh, really took their cue from the basis of anarchism, which is not chaos, but simply the replacement of old coercive systems with voluntary associations. And once that change is complete, you know, that began in the 19th century and continue today of this gradual, uh, it's almost like taking the grip off of society one finger by at a time. The, the best example I can think of for this transference uh, would be in the area of abortion. Um, right now, it's a very coercive system. The government's involved, religions are involved, corporations are involved, all working against a woman's right to control her own body. So that's the coercive system that is meant to be a voluntary association between that woman, that woman and her family and her doctor. Uh, another example of a coercive system is the military. This is probably the most disgusting example where uh, in this country, young economically disadvantaged people do not have a choice but to go in the military when all their options have been exhausted. It's not, would you like to go to college? or be in the military. It's like, okay, we'll send you to college if you join the military. And this keeps up a steady stream of powerless people fighting wars that justify huge government defense budgets. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're really filling body bags and being disposed of by the government through these crazy wars that uh, we keep stepping into and, and um, you know hopefully if Obama gets elected there'll be few of them but I have, I'm afraid if he doesn't we'll be walking into all sorts of countries like uh, Iran and Yemen you know making the same mistake over and over again so we must get rid of the military uh, as, as part of this change from coercive systems to voluntary associations. I'd like to add a few thoughts. Why? I think uh, you are really scaring me now because I was really assuming that they, uh, uh, the re-election of uh, President Obama was uh, a sure fact. Uh, I understand uh, is not the case. Do you think, is there any real possibility that Obama is not re-elected? Unfortunately, there's Unfortunately, always a possibility. There's always a possibility. We have the electoral college. Yeah, the system we have for electing a president is so obviously brain damaged that, uh, you know, it's hardly <laughs> worth spending time enumerating what's wrong with it. A great many things can go wrong. I'm quite positive and confident that Obama will be reelected. However, unlike a lot of people, I do not think Obama comes anywhere near being a savior or even someone who has any interest in addressing these problems. But he is anti-war. Uh, yes, he uh, couches it, his position as somewhat anti-war and uh, somewhat uh, pro-social needs, but. If you look at his acts over his entire administration so far, there's a lot that 
you know, it's basically been a repetition of the Bush administration with a few new ornaments thrown on the Christmas tree, such as he is not actively anti-gay the way the Bush administration was. But is his, are, is his fundamental attitude towards economics or towards the abuses of banking or different? No. And for instance, in terms of immigration, he has been the most vicious deporter of people perceived as illegal immigrants of any president in American history. Uh, I, if, you look under the, if you look under the surface at what Obama has done, it does not encourage one to think that he is a worthy person to be president, although the odds seem to be that he would be more likely to be a reasonable president than any of the crazy people that are running again, that are running for the Republican nomination at this point. I'd like to back up, though, and say that to me the Occupy thing is actually about, uh, also has a higher level action driving it. And at the risk of sounding <laughs> superstitious or something, I will say, you know, there is a saying which is attributable. Can you not do that? <laughs> Uh, which is the meek shall inherit the earth. And I think that it's time for the meek to take over the earth. I think it's time for the meek to take over the earth from the bullies and criminals that run it now. And they do this by refusing to pay any attention to those people any longer, by refusing to give them a role in running society. And my hope is that the Occupy movement will find within things that flow from it over the years ahead, the ability to create new instruments of social organization that displace the failed instruments of the past that we have. For instance, people are constantly talking about the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome, to quote another poet, I forget who, Poe, I think, but anyway. I don't think there is any glory in Greece or grandeur in Rome. These are failed civilizations of ancient times. And you can study them to see how they failed, but they are in no sense good examples for looking at the future. In fact, I don't think there is anything in human history that we can go back and look for as a model to the future. We have to cleanse our minds of our excessive belief in the importance of human history and precedent and create new rational principles. And when I say the meek shall inherit the earth, I think it is time for them to inherit the earth. I think the technologies are available for doing it. They are technologies that lie outside the domain of physical literal technologies and will attack the materialist society from directions that are totally unexpected and will cause its rapid wrap-up and termination and replacement with something new and far better. And, you know, that's really where we're coming from to provide the knowledge and information to people to realize how brutally they are exploited and allow themselves to be exploited by a group of bullies who have no interest in the welfare of humanity at all, but are simply interested in oppression, increasing their own privilege, and somehow, money. well, money, but, you know, just generally gaining more power and more ego satisfaction from the abuse of their fellow man. And this is a standard that is set by all human religions, all human governments, all human economies. And so the reworking of this is going to be a pretty big operation. It's not something we can rework. It's something that has to be reworked by the people themselves. But in order to rework it, they have to have a much more advanced position to start from. And right now, our society has brilliant accomplishments in the physical sciences, minimal accomplishments in the mind sciences, and no accomplishments publicly known in the, phys in the spiritual sciences. Although spiritual science has been a subject of study for generations, and there is a great deal known about it, all that information is buried right now behind walls established by religious organizations which say it's evil, it's a cult, it's satanic, and so forth. Well, just because it disagrees with them, naturally they would say that because they are the born bullies. That must be eliminated. And I think the way you eliminate it is by giving people a superior view of how the world really works.
So that's my little rant for the moment on that. The meek are ready to take over. Let's hope they will. And uh, I like very much uh, the very concise way that uh, Alison had a few minutes ago of uh, putting it down. When she said that uh, uh, the old world must go and must uh, make way for a, a new world, which uh, we hope will be better than the old world. And uh, speaking of a uh, change, speaking of a uh, very uh, radical change, uh, when we met uh, last time in uh, New York was also the time of the Singularity Summit. And uh, you have also an article on your website about uh, a transhuman views the Singularity Summit 2011. Now, we are all uh, uh, um, activists in the transhumanist movement, but uh, reading that article, I think uh, that uh, you also have some uh, critics about uh, the current state of uh, transhumanist thinking, especially as far as it uh, relates to the sexual freedom uh, Well, I should probably give a quick background on how I came to be involved in transhumanism at all and explain a couple of my perspectives uh, in order to properly answer that. Um, I uh, came into uh, interest in transhumanism primarily because of reading uh, Martin Rothblatt's uh, Apartheid of Sex. Um, the viewpoints she presented in there were so similar to ideas and viewpoints that I had constructed myself over the years that I was and that I was not aware of having seen in other places that was and given that her book was over 15 years old at the time I encountered it I was really uh, quite struck by that entire thing and I uh, will admit to having written Martine a shameless fan letter uh, about it, which resulted after some discussion in her suggesting that she felt this, this perspective on the importance of sexual freedom and erotic expression was something that actually was perhaps missing in transhumanist discussions and that perhaps uh, it would be worth my going to Milan and giving a talk generally in this area. Um, which I in turn did and of course there I met other folks involved in transhumanism and my interest and involvement has expanded little by little since then. Um, I guess in uh, speaking in Milan I basically was just trying to make the point that I thought there was an awful lot more to developing a truly transhuman a transcendent perspective of the human nature than uh, just the physical issues that for instance it would be important to understand the nature of human experiences beyond just the merely physical and interactive the emotional and spiritual content and that until we could do that it was difficult to talk really with much confidence about ideas like mind uploading for instance or transfer of consciousness to a mechanical substrate uh, so this was really what I was exploring in Milan, but then as I went further through it, I realized that the transhumanist community in general didn't really, uh, you know, the problem was just as bad as Martine has suggested. They really were not very interested in this subject. And I think part of the problem was a failure to recognize that there was technology behind this, uh, a tendency to think, oh, this is all myth, superstition, or quasi-religion or something. 
And here's where you come into a problem with any attempt to bring a spiritual viewpoint into the transhumanist community is you come up against the nominal atheists and the epistemological atheists and uh, the variety of people who label themselves that way who basically in many cases are not necessarily people lacking quote faith so much as people who simply refuse to buy in to the legendary uh, crap that they have been fed over the years and continue to be fed from our society. Um, so I could respect the transhumanist impulse to deal with the world rationally because that was exactly what I wanted to do as well. And so I, sometime after that I learned more about Martine's trans religion, Terrasim, and I recognize that many of the ideals that she has incorporated in that are like things that were also ideals that I felt were very important. Um, eventually though I realized that I didn't necessarily feel comfortable talking about this, that I was more interested in being this. And you will notice the title of the little blog you referred to is a transhuman views the singularity summit. And I chose that word to separate myself slightly from the body of transhumanists who I take as people who are engaged in more or less rational speculation about how proven factual things might develop, and uh, but are unfamiliar with the proven factual realities in domains beyond uh, material science, if you will, the physics of the kitchen. and. Uh, because I have devoted much of my life to the study of these other technologies and in particular spiritual technologies, uh, I felt it was time to begin to try to influence the community by providing some understanding of what these things are, where the gaps are in what's going on. And so I've done quite a bit of writing on the website that's in support of this uh, uh, approach to changing people's mind. When I attend the Singularity Summit, I attended it right after I had attended a much smaller and less organized affair called Ars Electronica in San Francisco. And Ars Electronica is an annual conference of sex technology innovators. Um, it was small, it, was not, it did not involve people of great means, but involved people who had great understanding of the subject they were trying to deal with, at least on the physical level, and had an unlimited amount of time, it would seem, in their personal lives to work on exploring the technology and doing things with it. Um, when I got to uh, Singularity Summit, what I saw were a lot of privileged New Yorkers in three-piece business suits uh, standing around looking for business opportunities and a bunch of established transhumanist figures standing up on the stage and sort of marketing those business opportunities without giving anyone an actual opportunity to become really engaged in them. Uh, part of that was because a lot of what was being marketed during the stage was just as hypothetical and fictitious as anything I might have made up and marketed. But I understood that if you put out these stories often enough and in a large enough uh, venue, you start to get people's attention. Now I personally knew, no, or well I can't say because it's all past tense, but I knew uh, Marvin Minsky and I slightly knew Ray Kurzweil and I am familiar with their thinking and Marvin's going back decades. Um, and <laughs> based on what they work from, it's fine, but actually the conclusions really don't pass muster as being rational conclusions. Um, and I don't mean to pick on those two leaders specifically, but generally the grounding in purely materialistic techne is what seems to me to be the fallacy in their thinking about the future, the singularity, and these other subjects. Uh, I don't personally believe that material technology can possibly bring about a singularity. Um, I think that the combination of physical, mental, and spiritual technologies definitely can bring about a singularity and one far beyond most people's guess. But that would be a singularity that totally reformed society and remade it, not a singularity that was based on some 
external force like a human built supercomputer imposing its will on everybody. Of course there are many other scenarios for how that might arise and I don't mean to say that's the only one but it seems to me that the there are massive effects merging right now in the development of human society. I feel like we are in the middle of these, we are trying to participate in these and the transhumanist work on the material level is advancing human welfare quite a lot. But I would like to see people become more interested in the intellectual and specifically the spiritual side of these technologies. And part of my writing is directed towards making people aware that genuine spiritual technologies do exist and have been proven over the ages to work and have been suppressed for the reason that the kind of liberation that we are talking about would in fact free the meek and would be inimical to the materialistic and bully oriented society we're living in now. So it's not in the interest of privileged elites to support a genuine transformation in society. What I saw in New York was a massive assemblage of a highly privileged elite and what I saw in San Francisco was an assemblage of a totally non-privileged elite that were elite only by their intellectual aspirations than by what they could have accomplished so far. But it seemed to me that both sides of this spectrum have something of great importance to offer. The continued pursuit of material understanding, welfare and well-being that was well represented at the Singularity Summit and a tempering influence on other things uh, beyond that, spiritual and so forth, that were not represented. Um, Frankly, the, transhu the reason I call myself a transhuman rather than a transhumanist, although I'm clearly a transhumanist as well, is because I have adopted a bunch of technologies that lie outside transhumanist thinking that currently shape how I live and behave. And I would hope to gradually over time help others understand and adopt those things. Well, I go on endlessly about this and I could shut up. Allison says she wants to say something too, so here's the mic. Um, uh, we often say here at Venus Plus X that sexual freedom is the bedrock of all freedoms and this is why. All over the world there is just one thing that every adult, probably with a few exceptions, can experience as one earth and that is sexual pleasure and orgasm and acknowledgement of that becomes the basis for true pluralism. I'm not talking about democracy which I look at as a real estate development set against the backdrop of true pluralism but a pluralism that's based on mutual acknowledgement between every person on earth that they share this common trait and it's quite a trait because in those moments of orgasm you get a feeling of freedom you know to the 10,000th power of what you feel like when you have freedom of speech for example or freedom from hunger or freedom from homelessness. It's on a scale that no artist or essayist has ever been able to describe in words or pictures or symbols. And this gives rise to, you know, a culture of individual sovereignty where personal autonomy is supreme in all human affairs. And because of that, we're able to care for each other at one, as one. And begin thinking about that moment of orgasm as a way to contact something outside of ourselves that's much greater than ourselves, a power beyond even our imagination. And that becomes the new sacrament and replaces all of this mythological, man-made, religion, people controlling cults that we currently suffer under.
I think this uh, really sounds pretty much like the uh, teachings of um, uh, Eastern uh, religions. Uh, I'm not really an expert on that. I don't know enough about uh, the religions of the Eastern, but wouldn't you say that uh, Eastern uh, religions are uh, much more uh, compatible with uh, what uh, Alison just said than uh, Western religions? Well, actually, I think that's a common confusion to think that Eastern religions are compatible in this respect. They are many Eastern religions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, in totally different ways, are much more accepting of things like gender variance, for instance. However, when you look at the societies that these religions have spawned, they are not basically functioning in any superior way. Now, not having grown up in these societies, I would hesitate to make specific criticisms of them from this viewpoint, whereas I can easily take Judeo-Christianity apart brick by brick and grind the bricks down to sand and there isn't anything left. But the fact is that all religions have somewhere buried in them some core of, uh, dare I say, truth or something that appeals to the human spirit or they wouldn't have hung around so long. But that's been backed up by the force of people who wanted to control people by using religion, uh, by using religion against them, which has been a major technique of conquest uh, through the ages. Uh, it's currently being used, it was, well, it was initiated in Africa by the British and the Portuguese primarily, and now it's being perpetuated by American fundamentalists who actively use fundamentalist Christianity as a tool to subvert the democratic processes of African countries in order they can gain control of their material resources. Well, that's more or less just business as usual, but... Uh, Well, that's, yes, that's another subject, and I, perhaps I'll introduce that now, since Allison reminded me of its relevance. It's a little different from what we were talking about before, but when I speak of spiritual technology, I mean the recognition of sacred sexuality. In other words, the fundamental human spiritual experience is orgasm, erotic pleasure, and orgasm are the occasions in which the actual physical realization of the human mind is able to come in contact with a infinite transcendent source of joy. And <clears throat> for us, any religious attitude that doesn't build on that as its foundation cannot possibly mature into a comprehensive view of the human situation and human needs. And unfortunately, that just doesn't exist. Um, you can't change people's minds in religion, though, by telling them that they're wrong all the time. Uh, this is a crowd that are so wrong, it's ridiculous. But you wouldn't be able to convince them by saying they're wrong. The important thing is to give them something that is so superior to anything they have been offered by a conventional human religion that they drop it and move on to join reality and participate in reality as opposed to what they're doing now. Um, that's a t It's difficult as human beings to not pick on the other side that, does, that represents the backward position. But uh, it seems that's really what's necessary in order to change people's hearts and minds. The technologies that are involved here are things that have been considered a cult in the past. They have been studied for hundreds of years. People have practiced them for hundreds of years. There's an enormous literature in the field that has been written. 
I doubt that there is anyone in the officially declared transhumanist community, certainly the crowd that was at Singularity Summit, who has any interest in this subject matter. But I have studied it off and on for 40 years, and it's quite clear that there is a body of effective technology that people just simply don't want to embrace because it will require a major rethinking of their relationship to the world and a major change in the practices, in their social practices. And it's a real technology. I mean, there are no miracles here. The fact that the human, a human can change their mind is not a miracle. It's just a fact of the way the human personality is constructed and how it interacts. And when someone else can change a person's mind by sharing an idea with them, that's not a miracle either. That's just another fact of reality. So I, I think we have to start recognizing that it is possible to have values that determine your life, that have uh, hold ideals that characterize your behavior, that have nothing to do with Abrahamic ideals of God or Christianist ideals of Jesus or other religious ideas of their respective gods and saviors who have to all be functionally equivalent at some level, but who all have different names and different personal histories attached to them. I think the bottom line, you know, we've come to the point to realize in world religious studies that Jehovah and Allah, whether they exist or not, refer to the same thing. And whether that thing is a, is a fiction of the human mind or not can be argued. But personally, I think that they refer to something that is a very real cosmic reality. But calling it God is a useless thing to say because every person in every culture has a different view of what God means. So I prefer to talk about things as that have to do with love. You know, everybody said, you know, a lot of people will tell you God is love. I say, maybe. <laughs> love is God. So that's just my radical two cents on that. Thanks for all. <laughs> An interesting thing that you said when you talked about uh, the uh, uh, technology of the kitchen room. Mm, in fact, uh, what we have now is the technology of the kitchen. It's not very advanced uh, if you pair it with the technology that we might have in a few decades or uh, in a few centuries. Now, of course, beyond the, the technology of the kitchen, we have the technology of the car, the technology of the uh, jet engine, the technology of the computer, the technology of the spacecraft, all things uh, much more advanced. Uh, what I think is that uh, uh, it's very difficult to see spirituality in the technology of the kitchen that we have right now. But uh, when one uh, contemplates future very advanced uh, technologies, it becomes uh, uh, easier again to see spirituality in the physical universe. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, reconciliation of uh, uh, science and spirituality via the uh, possibilities that will be offered by extremely advanced technologies was uh, the objective of the Turing uh, Church workshop that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, your talk. Uh, was uh, one of the most interesting uh, of the workshop. I'm going to ask you to repeat uh, your uh, presentation also because it is uh, available uh, online on the web for everyone who wants to see it. 
but maybe you can uh, summarize the main uh, guest of your uh, presentation in a few sentences. Yeah, I mean, we actually the idea I used in the talk was basically that I, well, let me say that the question of immortality, the search for some sort of personal survival or immortality, seems to be a major preoccupation of the transhumanist community. And I shouldn't limit it to them. It's obviously a major preoccupation of just about everybody who thinks about it at all. Um, I felt that. I feel this preoccupation with immortality is one of the problems that we have in our society, that we are focused on death as the end of our existence and don't recognize that we should be comporting ourselves and our work on this planet during our physical lives as if um, there were something quite a bit more going on than we observe on the kitchen table. Um, I, I basically, the key idea is the statement that I led off with, I am immortal. I personally claim that I am personally immortal. I expect to be a functioning feature of the universe forever, which is a very long time. And uh, I have in my own subjective experience a very definite recognition of that as a reality that comes about from having gradually shifted the focus of my concerns away from just the mundane and physical into uh, larger possibilities. Um, what the point I wanted to make is I personally experience the potential of my own immortality in daily life. And there, as far as I can see, no reason other people cannot recognize that they too have this potential experience of immortality. So a good bit of the introduction, introductory part of my talk to the T Turing Church workshop was to explain how it is that I see my own personal persistence beyond physical death in the as a factor in the functioning universe and to explain how that uh, function is open to everyone else as well and how then it affects your thinking once you come to realize these realities. In other words, how it changes the way you think about things. So this was really the sort of stuff that the uh, workshop was about. Um, I'm looking at the slides uh, behind you. Oh, yes. I also I talked about the nature of the idea that's very prevalent in a lot of transhumanist circles that somehow after everyone has somehow been put back together, reawakened from death, that at some point there will emerge a community of consciousness that will be able to, uh, depending on the, which section of the community you're talking about, but that will be able to develop perhaps godlike powers or some sort of synthesis, some sort of conscious synthesis of every surviving person's consciousness that somewhere, if you will, if I dare say at the end of time, although I don't think time has an end, but there's some point you will get to where a essentially transcendent being that we, everyone would recognize as God will emerge and be able to function in the universe and at that point, things will be uh, running much better than they do now, at least in theory. So a lot of part of my talk was to explain that I see this evolving, coming about in a fairly direct way. I think there's a process by which uh, this transcendent deity does come into being. It's going to take a very long time to get there because right now we are nowhere near it. It's going to take the input and help of an entire universe that many, uh, both in and out of the transhumanist community, don't even think exists in the sense of being populated with people. And um, well, it's real to individuals, yes, of course. 
Um, so uh, a, a part of the discussion was about trying to explain the nature of this uh, deity at the end of time, so to speak. And the final thing I did in the talk was this uh, rather strange little statement I interjected. I called a message from our sponsor where I basically said, I imagined that if the cosmic government that I work with were able to speak themselves to this group, there are a few things they would say. And one of the things I thought was really important that they would say was that there is a universe beyond what we see and experience physically every day, that it is engaged in supporting what we are doing, and that we can all participate in it. And in fact, I felt that the reason I was actually making this statement to the Turing Church group and getting it on record was so that people within the transhumanist community would at least get to know that there is one person who thinks there is an entire cosmic government that would be happy to accept help and support from any human being willing to take the time to pay attention to what they're concerned about. So that's really um, a lot of what was in the talk without going into the details that would attempt to justify. Um, and it was stuff I thought was important to say. Uh, for those who want to know more detail, I understand you are uh, thinking to write a book about these things. Can you say something about it? Well, in the process, in the last year, I've written a huge amount of stuff about this philosophy and viewpoint, but it has not. Uh, it's not written in a simple prescriptive way to say we ought to be doing this or we ought to be doing that. It more says, well, this doesn't make much sense, does it? Maybe that makes more sense. It's sort of speculative and so forth. After putting the statement together for the Turing Church Workshop, I realized that the story needed to be told in a straightforward way, less by hints and implications, which is the way it's always been told. Um, the great occultists of the past who have understood the truth of this uh, went to great trouble to hide the actual meaning of what they were saying because of fear of oppression. And they hid it so well that very few practicing occultists today even realize where their tradition came from. But this is, these are concepts that enlighten and change the way one views the world. And uh, I, they need to be exteriorized. And I think the time has come that this sort of view of spiritual reality can be communicated effectively to people because it is correct and because the ones communicated by existing religions are basically incorrect, uh, it will once it's made public and sufficiently disseminated, if people will take it at all seriously, I think it will change the world quite quickly. And that's one of the reasons it's been very vigorously suppressed over the years. Of course, we may encounter similar suppression. Uh, I wouldn't be sticking my neck out and talking about this if I thought that was likely in the present situation. But, uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen. The fact that I think the time is right to change the world doesn't mean the time is right to change the world. <laughs> I look uh, very much forward to reading your book, and I hope um, it will be out uh, soon. Uh, there is... Uh, um, Julio. Julio. Ah, okay, just switch your microphone. No, can I say that... No, can I say that... Is, oh, yeah. The book is... The, the, the book is not written. The book I've is just not written, written basically the first chapter so far. The first chapter so far. But it's going to be released, to serially, be released serially on our website. On our website. So it will be possible, so for, will people be possible for people to read it as it gets done. Read it. And pick yes. apart pick it apart and complain too. That's okay. So I look forward to start reading the book on your website as soon as uh 
the first uh, a chapter is available. Um, I'm going to ask you a difficult question now. I'm sure it will also be answered in the book, and I think you have answered it already as well. But, but I'm going to make it explicit. You seem to be basing a large part of your uh, worldview on uh, things that we do without our uh, physical body right now. And I'm referring, of course, to the pleasure of sex. At the same time, you seem to agree with me that uh, our maybe one of the last generations um, in the history of uh, humans, which will even uh, have such a thing uh, uh, physical body. Because I think we agree that uh, maybe not next year, maybe not, maybe not next uh, decade, but sooner or later, and uh, probably before the end of the century, mind uh, uploading technology will be uh, developed, and, and, and uh, then we will uh, uh, migrate to a life uh, as uh, a software beings without a physical body. How do you put these two apparently not very compatible uh, parts of your worldview uh, together? Yes, Julia. Well, you certainly point to a divergence between uh, my transhuman view of the world and the popular transhumanist view of eternal life. Um, I feel that it, it, it's quite obvious to me that the process of recording and uploading of experience and personal development is something that goes on continuously necessarily and involves, as you might say, processes beyond the kitchen sink or the kitchen. Um, whether a meaningful human consciousness can be uploaded to a material substrate, um, you know, is pure speculation in my opinion and has no evidence for it at this time. Uh, that doesn't mean it won't happen. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen. But of course, one of the less forcefully stated points of my talk in Milan was that unless a physical substrate could reproduce the emotional and spiritual components, and I focus particularly on the erotic as an example, although that's really all it is as an example, but it's a very fundamental one, uh, why would anyone choose to be uploaded? Uh, and you know, the, uh, the ethics of uh, of you know how you handle uh, an uploaded person if you even are willing to recognize that such a thing exists and is real uh, got very complicated in our subject I've heard plenty of discussions I mean we attended the Terrasim discussion on the ethics of artificial of well and of dealing with artificial personalities uh, that was on the day before the Turing Church workshop and her a lot of ideas on this subject um, I guess my own feeling is that the experimentation that is going on in trying to model human behavior, cognition in machines is certainly reasonable and useful experimentation and we will learn a great deal from it. We will engineer very uh, persuasive avatars. We will perhaps engineer things that are able to expand our own consciousness through mechanical means. But until we understand what is going on in the human mind, uh, I'll pin it down at one point and say at the moment of orgasm, although it, there are plenty of other times as well, until we understand what's going on there, I don't think we can have any confidence that a rule-based replication of a human mind in a basically sequential machine uh, can... Uh, come anywhere near providing an adequate life experience and therefore no one would choose to um, survive that way. Um, 
you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, you can look at chat bots that exist now and, uh, you know, it's not to me very persuasive to think that that technology is going to, no matter how many rules you put in, is going to incorporate the fundamental characteristics of being human. Now, I would suggest that I think that because I have spent a lot of time studying the actual capabilities of sequential machines and I do not sense that most transhumanists understand the limitations of sequential machines that there are so much that cannot be computed or known computationally by a sequential machine and I've spent my life working with sequential machines and thinking about them and I just do not see uh, the I do not see the scenario you lay out as being accomplished with the type of sequential machine technology that exists today. Now, could some sort of quantum computer be able to do something in this domain? Perhaps, but that requires well, of course a certain I didn't say that. Computer be able to, I'm sorry. You, you did not say that. You did not say that. Uh, um, I didn't. Uh, I'm sorry if I interrupted. I didn't, um, I didn't uh, necessarily mean machines uh, similar to, to the machines we have in the kitchen sink today. But I know, I know that it's going to be something much more advanced than that. And I was going to ask you what you think about the computation of substrate that cannot be reduced to sequential machines. And the example that I was going to make was the example of uh, quantum computing that you uh, introduced uh, spontaneously the same month. So sorry for not uh, having enough uh, Trust in you, and I'm switching the microphone off again. You are saying what I wanted to ask you. Well, I uh, <clears throat> I don't know what the potential of quantum machines is. Uh, my own tendency uh, is to think that the phenomena that link the human brain mind experience with what I think of as the transhuman brain mind experience are probably quantum connections and that what's missing from our attempts to understand the human brain at this point is that we just haven't mapped it and understood it down to a fine enough level where we can see the individual quantum processes that go on in some parts of the brain that provide this kind of connection. Now I can't prove that such a thing exists or doesn't exist you know it just is at this point speculation on my own part but it does seem to be an area where the human brain could potentially connect to something beyond the human uh, beyond the purely physical um, I'm not sure I mean that's just a speculation though really because it's not uh, it could be some totally different mechanism that we haven't even thought of yet I suspect that entanglement has a great deal to do with this. I, I don't feel we understand entanglement very well and based on the latest work on the superluminal neutrinos I think we are opening a door into a completely new kind of physics uh, in, in which uh, the superluminal physics and we will probably discover that entanglement is a superluminal product well, I think we know it is already. We just haven't accepted that that's what the data shows. And that we will find that entanglement ties together parts of physical reality in ways that we're not aware of at all. And isn't a property that exists necessarily between photons or electrons or microscopic properties. It's also a macroscopic property that in some way uh, is out there altering the behavior of things but we really obviously have no decent physical data about this at all right now other than that there's this weird phenomenon exists and now that maybe neutrinos can go faster than light I mean but that's not much to base a theory of the world on yet but I think it's a worthy area to be exploring Yeah, Allison makes the point that 
you know, you should also consider the scientific impulse to understand these things better that really comes from something inside the human mind or the human spirit. Uh, why does this elaborate, you know, if this is just about a sequential machine, why has it evolved such complex behaviors uh, related to motivations and so forth that are not observables or that are only indirectly observable things? Oh well, it's I said really fascinating things, and uh, as we have discussed uh, many times, you know that, that I also think uh, without being able to say exactly how, but uh, I also have uh, some sort of feeling that uh, entanglement has uh, uh, something uh, to do with uh, the nature of consciousness, uh, things that, that we have also to think think of uh, the people uh, who are uh, watching this online. So could you explain um, as simply as possible just what entanglement is and uh, uh, why it's something that we should be interested in? Well, <clears throat> Entanglement is simply a phenomenon that's been observed at uh, basically, I could say, the quantum level of reality, although it isn't clear there's a specific quantum level of reality. But when you look at very tiny things that have very little mass or energy associated with them, and uh, you can, it turns out that you observe that uh, they can exist in complementary states. Uh, and entanglement basically means that if two separate objects are entangled, there will be one attribute of one and a complementary attribute of the other that are linked together in such a way that if you make a measurement or a determination of the state of one, you will learn, you, you can predict that the state of the other will be exactly complementary in some sense based on the way in which they are entangled. Uh, it's basically saying it, it could be something as simple as the polarization of an electron that's entangled with another electron. And when you measure the polarization of one, the polarization of the other is guaranteed to be exactly the opposite. Uh, it's not guaranteed to be by theory or by first principle. It's simply that we've made this actual observation and it really works that way. And uh, the other thing we learn is that uh, these two entangled objects can be separated by kilometers in space, and yet the determination of a measurement on one will have the effect on the other uh, instantaneously, faster than any signal could be communicated by electromagnetic means between them. And I think this bears out the point that our entire 20th century view of physics is pretty badly contaminated with the idea that the speed of light is the governing speed of things in the universe. Um, that clearly is a pretty accurate statement about defining our perceptions of a world when we make those perceptions using electromagnetic radiation that moves at the speed of light through space. However, I would just ask people who think relativity is an absolute to consider what the consciousness would be of a con self-conscious species that lived entirely underwater and only did its sensing by acoustic waves. What would its limiting velocity be? Well, of course, what the nature of water is such that once you pass the speed of sound, you get a lot of strange behavior and probably much richer behavior than you get in space-time, although we don't know how to measure the turbulence in space-time when something is on the other side of the light barrier. But the fact is when you try to make measurements at all using the types of energies that are directly involved, uh, you're going to get something, your measurements are going to be completely conditioned by the character of the signals you're using to make the measurements. So you know, the smart dolphin will see the speed of sound as the limiting velocity of things and uh, things that approach the speed of sound get shorter and time changes and all these things occur underwater 
at the speed of sound if you live in a physical world that doesn't know about optics. And I, I would say that the obvious stupidity of this sound argument, an unsound argument, if you will, uh, is simply that because we see the world electromagnetically, we understand much better what's going on. Well, if you want to have a little imagination exercise, suppose there are beings who see the world um, transluminally. You see the world using these faster than light neutrinos or some other phenomenon we haven't got nailed down. Well, to them, our concerns about the limitations of electromagnetic propagation probably seem just as naive as our concerns about, uh, oh, if you can only hear things, how, what will your perception of the world look like? Uh, I perhaps have this view because I spent a number of years working in sonar physics for Raytheon before I went to my real job. Um, and it's pretty obvious that uh, these correlations exist and, you know, deciding, you know, the, 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 the philosophical change that occurred between, uh, well, basically Lorentz and Minkowski was probably the substitution of a myth for an actual set of physical observations. And then Einstein has been building on the myths ever since. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, already taken uh, much more time than we scheduled uh, for this conversation. Uh, before uh, closing, I would like to ask you just what is uh, your advice to the about uh, thousand uh, participants to the uh, Singularity Summit in October, and how do you think the singularity and the transhuman movement should uh, continue to develop? Well, <clears throat> how I think it should continue to develop. I, I, I think that it would be presumptuous of me to tell them that. Um, there are so many different groups pursuing so many different things. Uh, they're really going to have to explore them and see what works. But it, it would be presumptuous to say, well, that isn't going to work out front. I wouldn't even say that you can't at some point uh, find a way to resurrect a frozen body. Um, a lot of things are possible given enough time to study it and so forth. Um, I would have doubts that if you resurrected my frozen body that I would be part of the scene, but that would remain to be determined once you were able to actually do it. Um, as far as advice, I, I think they just have to pursue what they're doing, but I think if there's a gap, it's they need to be more open to initiatives and thoughts that are coming from domains of lesser privilege academically and financially. Um, it is unlikely that anyone is going to make money off religious or spiritual side of transhumanism, uh, especially since it isn't even something that appeals to a lot of transhumanists. Um, but I do think that uh, there is an opportunity here for transhumanists like yourself, Julio, and the other participants in the Turing Church, uh, as well as others who probably don't yet know about it, who uh, there's an opportunity for them to think more broadly about possibilities. And since we are, in fact, trying to uh, turn over fresh ground in unexplored areas, and since so much work has been done on the physical, I think broadening the perspective not just into the psychological but into the actual spiritual would be an important step for the transhumanist community. And I don't mean that everybody needs to suddenly go get religion, but I think to the extent there is an open-minded, uh, somewhat spiritually oriented community, they can perhaps show some of the rest of the community that this is not just a strange dream or a fantasy. I know that you yourself see spiritual components of transhumanism 
and you probably do not see the ones that I'm pointing to which go far beyond what is physically proven at this point uh, and demonstrable on the kitchen table so to speak but uh, I think that if people will open their minds of inquiry into the rest of human knowledge uh, they will learn that there is a great deal uh, that could also be explored and the exploration of these additional ideas would surely illuminate what's going on in the transhumanist community. Now beyond that I think that perhaps you know the goal is ultimately someone finds a way to explain this stuff simply to people who don't share the transhumanist viewpoint or who don't have all the background or haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it just give them a package that they can unwrap that say say oh my god this is what I've been waiting for all these years but we haven't got that package yet um, and I sense that a lot of what's been presented in the Turing Church program has been people's attempts to say well this is what turns me on and you sort of line up different people's experiences and viewpoints uh, ranging from the I would say the close traditional religious all the way to the completely unorthodox and you just line them up and say what is common among these and you know in sort of when I gave a talk trying to talk about spirituality or personal religion if you will without introducing concepts like God and Christ into the discussion um, you get a very different result and you get something that doesn't immediately challenge people from other religions something that doesn't immediately challenge even atheists necessarily um, whether that message can be shaped in a way to appeal to more people I don't know that's part of what all this is about um, I guess I talk to transhumanists particularly hoping to find people who are not totally enmeshed in the mythology of the past and are willing to consider new things because they obviously are considering a lot of uh, new things thank you very much Alison and Dan it was really a great conversation uh, I'd like also to thank uh, uh, someone else who is here who we have not seen which is uh, Kania, a very well-known uh, person in the transhumanist world who has been uh, recording everything on video and uh, Kania has also been writing uh, uh, many comments and observations that we are going to read now but I think we can stop the